So why do we want to conserve tigers and leopards? Why are they important? Um, so leopards inhabit less than 6% of their historical range. Um, and this is a 42% decline since 2006. Um, so what you can see on the map there is where they are currently. Um, so, um, but obviously they have declined from large areas of that expense. Uh, then there are nine subspecies of tigers. Three of them are extinct and all the others are threatened with extinction. Um, and a lot of sort of big charismatic species um, are termed umbrella or keystone species. They don't necessarily have to be big megafauna species. They can also be small um, to be umbrella or keystone. This basically means that they, keystone species means they're very important for that ecosystem. They help maintain different aspects of that ecosystem. Um, and umbrella species means that they are um, sort of a useful iconic species which you can do conservation work under that umbrella, but it benefits everything within that ecosystem if you protect a, a habitat or area where that species occurs. Um, why conserve leopards? Um, so you can see from the map that the red area is where leopards used to be. And um, so all of that, and then the orange area is where they, where we think they occur now. Um, but many of the countries that they live in, we know that they are present, but we don't have country population estimates. So we don't actually have a global, a good global estimate of, of all leopard species. Um, unlike tigers, where we have a slightly better understanding of how many we actually have globally. Um, so there are nine subspecies. Um, there are only four or five that have been properly assessed. Um, one of them is extinct and all the others we think are threatened with extinction. Um, and again, they are umbrella and keystone species like tigers. Uh, why are they so important to conserve them in Nepal? Um, so tigers have had a 63% uh, population increase between 2008 and, th and 2013. This is really important. So the current tiger population in the triarate landscape, which is Tau, um, is 235 from the last assessment in 2018. Um, so the government do tiger assessments every three years for a census. Um, so depending on COVID, I don't know how that will affect the census. There should um, be one uh, next year. Um, so with an increasing human population and an increase in tiger population, this can theoretically increase human tiger and human leopard conflicts. Um, so in Chitwan National Park and Bardia National Park, they are the two areas where, the, where we work. Um, and between 2006 and 2012, on average, four people a year are killed um, by tigers in, in human tiger instances. Um, in 2009, um, in Bardia, uh, we had nine human tiger instances. Um, not everyone was killed. Some people were injured. One tiger was removed and put into captivity for the safety of itself and people. Um, uh, and the decade before that, we didn't have any human tiger conflicts in Bardia. So you can see how the conflicts vary year on year between the areas. So it's it's a it's a complicated subject to understand human wildlife conflict. So what is the problem that we're trying to solve? So for us, it's human wildlife conflict. And uh, obviously tigers and leopards use the same space as humans. Um, big cats can eat livestock, which are important part of, of lots of livelihoods. Um, and this is particularly important in Nepal. Um, and um, in... Uh, So human failure uh, instances can result in human injury and fatality, and conflicts can result in retaliation killings. So um, conflict outcomes, this is important because it, it, it's, it's a two-sided story. You, you have, it's not just impact on, on people, it's also impact on, on 
the animals that are involved. So you have financial hardship for the communities that are affected. You also have physical and well-being impacts to humans and their families. Um, you know, if the if the primary income person you know has been injured. Uh, you also have physical and well-being impacts to the big cats, and this can often jeopardise felid conservation efforts. So this is the area that we work in. So you can see that Nepal uh, borders between China uh, and India, and the triart landscape is what you can see in that map there, which is the, the lower section of Nepal, uh, which is mainly lowland tropical dry forest. And the areas that we work in are Chitwan National Park and Bardia National Park. So this is Bardia National Park. And so Bardia National Park um, is in the west or towards the west of Nepal. Um, and there's, uh, the National Park has a core area uh, of 968 kilometers squared. And then it has a community buffer zone surrounding it, which you can see there on the map um, of 327 kilometers squared um, and people live within within that buffer zone and there's no fence around that, the national park um, so wildlife and people utilize the same space in in the community buffer zones and that's the same for Chitwan National Park so you can see the core area there um, and that's made up of nine 953 square kilometers um, and then the community buffer zone in the lighter green um, is, is quite large, um, which is uh, 766 square kilometers. Um, so they're the areas that we work in, and you can see that we work in four communities. So the Bardia communities, um, you can see them in those different sections and the Chitwan communities. So the way the project works so that we can assess how the interventions work is we have communities that are control communities, which receive interventions uh, sorry um which don't receive interventions and then we have treatment communities which do receive interventions so this is important because we can test whether the interventions are having impacts on wildlife and people in those villages by having that those control villages which don't receive interventions um, and that's really important from a scientific point of view to make sure that the interventions we are putting in actually work so that we can continue to replicate, replicate them in other communities. So what's the solution? So we have evidence-based conservation. Um, this means that we do research alongside conservation to make sure that it's working. Um, and we use an adaptive management system that we can constantly evolve the project to make sure it's having the best intended outputs. Um, and then we have the coexistence interventions, which are split into two, two types. So we conduct uh, reduction interventions, so conflict reduction. Um, and then um, the poverty alleviation, because they're the two goals of the Living with Tigers project is to alleviate poverty and to reduce human wildlife conflict. So I'm going to talk about each of those separately. Um, so just to explain the photos, because I think they're lovely, um, the top photo is myself and one of our uh, community uh, research officers, um, Bikash. He's great. So there's there's a tiger print that we're recording there um, and he's helping me record the, the data. Um, and then this is a local farmer that we were, we were speaking to um, who uh, was telling us about his his livestock being predated. Uh, this is um, just as the project started when we first went out in 20, 2016, before we started implementing any of the activities. We were speaking to local communities uh, and seeing how conflict impacted their lives. And then the picture in the bottom is a Living With Tigers project predator-proof pen. And I'll come back to that shortly. So evidence-based conservation, like I said, it's, it's conservation that's based on evidence. Uh, so we do research to make sure uh, that we can actually assess and monitor what we're implementing in a conservation management plan. So we did ecological research. This meant that we did um, uh, camera trapping. Uh, we did a footprint identification technique, which I'll come back to. Um, then we did 
genetic analysis. Uh, we did community camera trapping workshops and community feedback meetings. And all of these things are, in a, are important and I'll explain why. Um, so the top photo um, is again um, uh, myself and I'm doing a training workshop uh, with the people that you can see in the photo below as a group, um, which is a local NGO that requested some training on how to do footprint identification technique. So we did that training with them. Uh, the, the photo in, in the bottom is a, a tiger scat, uh, which we're doing genetic analysis of. So camera trapping. So camera trapping are remote cameras, which you attach uh, to a post or a tree and they record wildlife and anything that passes in front of them. Um, and it's based on movement and heat. Um, so we use cameras uh, that are um, uh, a red flash at night, uh, which um, a lot of animals can't see, some mammals can. Uh, so humans can see the red light, but there's no flash. Um, that's why the photos are black and white at night because there is no flash. It's, it's to reduce the impact of the camera being there uh, for the wildlife. Um, so you can see the, the range of wildlife that we get. Um, I'll start at the top and go along um, as if you were reading a sentence in a book just to explain what they are. Uh, so you've got Chital in, in the top corner on the left. Um, and then you've got a common palm civet, a trilanga, leopard, elephant, sloth bear, uh, golden jackal, jungle cat, striped hyena, porcupine, wild boar, one horned rhino, you've got macaque, hog deer, Bengal tiger, swamp deer, crab eating mongoose, fishing cat. Um, right at the bottom in the left hand corner is a yellow throated martin. Uh, you have a nilgai, just type of antelope, a doll, which is like a red wolf, another Bengal tiger, um, another one horned rhino, and uh, a gower. Uh, which is a sort of a very sort of large wild wild buffalo. Um, so from these cameras, we put them out in the community buff zones and the national park to understand how animals are moving between the different areas and how often, you know, what wildlife is using the community buff zone areas in relation to the park. You know, what animals are coexisting with people in the buff zones. That's really important. Um, so for um, between the two, the two sites, um, we, so Bardia and, uh, and Chitwan, we recorded 34 different mammal species inside the core areas of the park. Um, and in the community buff zones, we recorded 29 different mammal species. So the difference between that is not very much, which really highlights the importance of these community buffer zone areas for wildlife and why it's so important that we learn how people can coexist with wildlife and help them with that. So community based camera trapping. So we did training with the communities. Uh, this is important for several reasons. So um, this is the first time I worked in Nepal. They obviously live there. They know the areas. They know their community forests. Um, they have anti-poaching groups, so community-based anti-poaching groups, um, and they're based up of, of the community members who volunteer to do that role, that, you know, they, they like wildlife, they want to protect their wildlife and their forest, um, so they volunteer. So all the people that you see are all part of those, those groups or have wanted to have training in ecological research. So we didn't just give them training on camera trapping, we gave them training on lots of different ecological techniques. Um, and we also donated um, wildlife guidebooks, which you can see in, in the bottom photo there that we're giving them guidebooks because they didn't have access to them before. Um, so the ones that basically were available for Nepal, we, we gave them uh, guidebooks so that they could learn and share with other people. Um, so we did the camera trapping with them so that they could learn, but also they then joined us uh, who wanted to as um, part of our ecological team to set up the cameras and collect them. Um, and this is important because they showed us the best places where they regularly see tiger and leopard footprints. Um, so that was great, which meant we were, we were setting the cameras up in the right places. So our data was much better. And um, at the end of the project, 
uh, we did community feedback meetings. So we explained to them uh, the results of the camera trapping and we gave them posters, uh, which here are some examples. So um, they might not have known, um, you know, a lot of the animals uh, move around at night. Obviously some do move around in the day. Um, so this was a nice way to thank the communities for their hard work and their participation. And the fact um, that a lot of the community forests, uh, they did do some tourism in them. So this was a helpful way for them to increase their, their wildlife tourism. Um, so you can just see the range of different species in different community forests, they vary a lot. Um, and particularly for some of these, these animals, um, you know, they are, uh, you know, threatened with extinction and quite elusive and quite rare. So sloth bears quite rare um, in terms of detecting them on the cameras and the same for Dole, the, the, the red wolf. Um, so communities were very excited about having confirmed photos um, from their community forests. Um, so that was that was a really nice relationship that we formed with the communities. Uh, so as part of the ecological research, we did transex, which is basically where we walked sections of different habitats and forests to try and record tiger and leopard presence. But we also recorded all of the wildlife that we found and what type of sign it might be, whether it was a track or feces or whether we physically saw them, which was great. Uh, we saw elephants a couple of times. Um, uh, in Bardia, which was really special to see because uh, uh, a, lot, a lot of the time you don't see them. We saw a family group and we saw a big bull and that, that was amazing. Um, and I've seen lots of rhinos and they are also extraordinary. Um, so the footprint identification technique was designed by WildTrack um, and it's a, an award-winning technique which has developed um, significantly over the years that I've been working with them. Um, so you can see the three pictures here. This explains the process. So the picture on the left is a tiger footprint uh, that I've that we recorded. And what you do is you put the the rulers next to the print. It has to be taken directly above the print. Um, and then what you can see in the next photo is how we process it. So we put the dots in the right places to say where each toe is and where the main pad is. And then that goes into an algorithm um, based on tigers or leopards or other wildlife, depending on what, what species you're, you're doing. And based on that algorithm um, of known individuals, um, for example, from zoos, we then get this output to say who is who. So from a footprint, you can tell whether it's male or female and which individual that footprint belongs to. So basically you have to record several footprints in a row. So you get a trail of footprints and that's how you can then um, statistically say, what, you know, whether it's that individual because you need enough footprints to get enough accuracy. So that's how the, the technology works, uh, but that's now transitioned into a new app where you don't need to have the rulers with you any this you know this technique can be used by anyone um so you can take a photo using the app and then it uh, it uploads it into the database um that wild track have of lots of different species as it's all publicly available data um if 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 you're choosing a, a public project it depends on the project that you're uploading a photo to um and it yeah outputs you know who it might be um, so we already have a database for tigers and leopards in Nepal. Um, so people can, you know, record a record a, a track and then send that into the database, which is great. So that's how that works. Um, and then the last thing we did was genetic analysis. Um, and uh, that um, is really important to understand, again, who is who. Um, and also what they've eaten. So we're still in the process of analyzing that data at the moment, the genetic data to understand the, uh, the diet. We know who is who, but we haven't uh, finished the, the diet analysis yet. So the other important side to the research is social science. So we're trying to understand the, the wildlife. We've talked about that, but what we want to also understand is the people, who they are um, and how conflict impacts them. Um, and how we can help them um, to help themselves to 
reduce conflict and to alleviate poverty. So what we want to know is who is at risk of conflict, what tolerance levels do they have, um, natural resources that they collect, um, livestock predation characteristics, income opportunities and human well-being. So natural resource collection is important because previous literature shows that the majority of people that are involved in in human wildlife conflict instances have been collecting natural resources or been fishing. Um, so they've gone into the forest because they need those resources, either because they can't afford to buy them or they don't have access to them um, in other places. So that's why we wanted to know um, those pieces of information because that tells us who's at risk, how often they're going in and, and who is at risk. So by talking to different communities, this is sort of summarizing uh, from the first surveys that we did, um, talking to different communities, you know, what, what, how they feel, what the problems are. This is from a stakeholder meeting that we had with, with the communities. So this is asking them about tigers, or, you know, what's, what's there? Um, these are all the different words that come out. Um, and then we had the same, we did the same for leopards. What are the different things that, that come out for people? What are important for the communities? Um, so we did, we did these household surveys. So we, we asked different households. Um, so we did surveys in 2016 at the start of the project in 2017, and then at the end in 2018. And we did over 800 household surveys in each of those years. Um, uh, so that's a very large amount of data um, that we're working with to really understand who these people are and um, you know how they feel affected and what conflict they're reporting um, and therefore how we can try and help them to help themselves. So now we're gonna talk about the coexistence interventions. Um, what exactly did we, what exactly did the Living With Tigers project do? Um, so we wanted to improve livelihoods and we did that through training workshops. So we ran agricultural training workshops and we ran livestock husbandry workshops. We also did um, alternative livelihoods. So new, new livelihoods that people wanted to learn. We didn't just say, this is what we suggest. We asked, did them, asked them what they wanted. Um, and so this is um, the ones that came out strongly was um, learning women's traditional crafts um, and also homestays. So homestays are part of um, Nepali culture. Um, so people come and stay in the community buff zone in homestays and then they go either, you know, uh, to do wildlife tourism inside the park or they go into a, into a community forest to try and see wildlife. Um, we also ran first aid workshops because that's what the, um, the communities ask for. Um, and this is, uh, you know, really important. A lot of them don't have access to those those types of resources. So for, for example, one of the communities that we work with in Chitwan is a three hours drive from the nearest hospital. Uh, so if, if you needed an ambulance, it would take three hours for the ambulance to get to you and three hours for you to go back to the hospital. So we did first aid training and provided them with, with first aid kits in, in their community committee so that, that those communities could come to the committee if they needed anything. Um, we did biogas stoves, and this is linked with natural resource collection. So by having a biogas stove, um, which is linked to um, the household toilet, but also can be linked with, if they have livestock, that can be, their livestock shelter area can be linked also to the biogas stove. So it means the amount of natural resources they have to go collect from the forest is either reduced or not altogether so that they've got the biogas instead. And then predator-proof pens to help reduce livestock predation. And then we did social marketing. And I'll explain uh, what that means uh, in a moment. So these are bio, uh, these are predator-proof pens. And these are some of the different communities and their, their predator-proof pens. They vary depending on the number of livestock they have. Um, so we help support them to improve or make these um, these predator proof pens so so they put money into into this as well um, so they have investment in this um, and they all were then part of this 
um, livestock breeding group. They all, jo all joined and attended the, the livestock training as well. So they're all sharing knowledge and learning from each other as well. So horticultural training. So this is something that's quite important. So uh, the communities that we work with are marginalized. They're extremely poor from the data that we, we analyzed from the social science surveys. Um, the majority of households are living on three pounds per month um, per person. So it's a very small amount of money that they're living on. So having having land next to their house, um, you know, to grow vegetables is a really important part of Nepali culture. So helping them improve that either just so that they can eat or that they sell those those produce in the local markets um, is really important. So the horticultural team at Chester Zoo went out and did horticultural training workshops in 2017 and 2018. Um, and these are some of the photos from those workshops and we had fantastic feedback. So they requested more, the communities requested more. That's why we, we did the training in the following year. Um, and um, so, yeah, they learned lots of different techniques and how to improve their growth, rotational crops, how to naturally deal with um, any insects or infections and things like that. So it's a really important process and a really important training. Um, uh, and they were all given uh, booklets at the end so that, you know, they didn't have to remember what they were learning. And it was all all in Nepali. We translated it into Nepali um, and we have them in English um, so that they can also teach others and share. So that uh, the communities had this communal plot where they all went to learn and practice those techniques. So others could also do the same and they could teach others in that community afterwards. Um, so that was a really good, a good workshop. And that's part of our train the trainer program where we're transitioning that for the next stage of the project where people who have already been trained as part of the living with tigers project depending on whether that's horticultural workshops or livestock predation or things like that they can go to other communities and train others uh, so it becomes a community-based system um, to learn how to coexist with wildlife and improving livelihoods so that's our train the trainer program that that we're implementing um, some of the other crafts that they that they did were were women's traditional crafts, which are beautiful. I, I have some at home. Um, they um, uh, the community said thank you to me at the end of end of the the work that we did, and they gave me some of their homemade crafts. Um, they're 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 really very beautiful. Um, and then you can see that the biogas stove. So you can see the the toilet um, uh, for the house on the right, and the biogas stove is 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 underneath, and that links to the house. Um, so that's really useful. Okay, so social marketing. So what is social marketing? Social marketing is about social good. It's, it's about creating different human behaviours that create a social change for good. Um, so there's other terms for it. Some people call it conservation marketing, I mean, that's specific to conservation, um, but the original term was social marketing. Um, and it's about sharing knowledge, changing human behaviors, um, and it's, it's community-based changes. It's, it's not about us going in saying, you must do this. It's about talking to communities and then sharing knowledge about what we've learned and how they can um, better protect themselves in our case. Um, and, and then we do different types of activities um, that where it's community people sharing knowledge with other community people. So what we did is, uh, so this is a poster for the radio show that we did. So we said we did several radio shows um, and we wrote the script with uh, local uh, Nepali writers um, about a story about coexistence. So people living with tigers and leopards and how people should react if, if they if they see animals in the forest and you know not to go into the forest at night or during the early morning or even or evening because that's when animals are most active and how to behave in the forest to help protect yourself and all these different things that you know can help them protect themselves and we, we did it in a way that that 
communities could feel like they're learning from others. It's not an outsider message. Um, so this is a radio show poster. Um, and we did a radio show because a, a lot of the people who we're trying to target are illiterate. They, they don't have, um, you know, any literacy skills. So if we put it into a newspaper as a small article, it, it, it wouldn't work, but they would listen to the radio. We also did street dramas as well. Um, again, we worked with 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 local local scripts um, uh, and local writers to write these plays, uh, and then uh, you know local actors um, came and did those performances. Again, telling the same story of how people can coexist and live with wildlife, and and how humans can change their behaviour. Um, some simple steps to change their behaviour that better protect themselves and their family. Um, so that's what what social marketing is, um, and and that worked worked really well. Um, so that was great. Uh, so I know there's a lot of text on this slide, but don't panic. I'm going to go through each each point. But I just want to say what we've achieved so far as the Living with Tigers project, and all this information comes from all the analysis I've been doing um, as part of my PhD. Um, so in the eight communities that we worked with. Like I said, we conducted these large scale household surveys of over um, 2,400 um, and we had a 50% increase in positive attitudes towards felids, so the tigers and the leopards, which is, a, which is fantastic. Um, we also reduced human tiger instances, um, so we had seven at the beginning of the project and we had zero in our eight communities and it continues to be zero. We didn't have any human leopard incidences um that that were um reported by the communities uh, we provided livelihood training um to over two thousand people um and we increased household incomes so this was really good uh, we reduced livestock predation by 55 percent this is excellent um we empowered women so we provided training um and engaged over a thousand women throughout the project uh, we reduced the amount of time spent collecting natural resources and grazing the livestock inside the forest. This is really important because this reduces the chances of encounters with wildlife and therefore reduces the likelihood of, of a conflict event. We produced the first human wildlife coexistence booklet for communities in Nepali, again, to share knowledge um, about how people can coexist and reduce conflict. This was great. Um, we asked communities in Nepal for the first time how they want human felid conflicts addressed. Um, and this indicated high tolerance, positive attitudes, and a strong tendency towards collaborative conservation that promotes human wildlife coexistence. So this was really important. So we basically gave them a different set of scenarios of a conflict event. Um, and, uh, and gave them lots of different actions and they had to say whether that action was acceptable or not. And this indicated their attitudes and their tolerance. So this was really, really, really important that we came out with high tolerance and positive attitudes and they wanted to collaborate. They wanted to be part of the solution um, to coexist and to reduce conflict and manage wildlife. Um, so camera trapping confirmed new detections of tiger and leopard in many community forests outside the protected areas. Um, many were the first time um, that, that they'd been recorded. Um, also, we surveyed many community forests that have not been surveyed before. So that this was really important to try and understand how, how it works because the, the, the government tiger census cover the corridor areas um, and also the core area, but they don't survey um, the buffer zone. So we really wanted to focus on what was happening in the buffer zone, what wildlife is using the buffer zones, the same places that people utilize. Um, so we rediscovered um, the threatened rusty spotted cat in Bardia National Park uh, in 2017. And we've got an article coming out in, in Cat News um, in the next edition this year um, about that discovery. Um, and my Nepali colleague has, has, um, ha has written up that paper with me. We 
uh, identified uh, that threatened dolls utilize community forests outside protected areas. This is really, really exciting. Um, uh, we collaborated with WildTrack on the Nepal database for tiger and leopard individual footprints. This is vital for human felid conflict mitigation and management. Um, I'm one of the core team working towards WildTrack's first educational video game on tigers, and that will be coming out soon. So I'm very excited about that. Um, our camera trap data is used by the Nepali government um, alongside the tiger census um, to estimate the tiger population. And we're currently in collaboration with um, NTNC, which is National Trust for Nature Conservation, and DMPWC, which is Department of National Parks and Wildlife Conservation, which is the Nepali government. Um, and we're currently conducting the first leopard population estimate for Nepal. We're pulling all of our data together to work on, on that. So this is all really exciting, and this is great for phase two of living with tigers for us to, walk, to work towards expanding out the project into other communities. So phase two. Um, so we want to transition this into a community-based approach. Like I was saying before about the train the trainer programs, it's about taking everything we've learned from those eight communities and training those eight communities so that they can go out and train other communities and have a livelihood from being those trainers um, and transition that to this community-based approach. So to do that, we're going to establish a living with tigers committee and different members of our current communities that we work with and local NGOs. Um, national parks and a government member will be part of that committee and they can make future decisions of the Living with Tigers project rather than it being a Chester Zoo run project. It would be a locally run project, um, which is great. So that's the aim for phase two is to transition it into that. Um, and um, that means it can have a sustainable future rather than having big international aid. It can be a, a community based sustainable project to go forward. Um, and um, if anyone wishes to, to donate to the Living with Tigers project, you can either do so through um, my GoFundMe page. So this goes directly to the Chester Zoo website for this specific project. So I, I never have that money. It goes directly to Chester Zoo. Um, or you can donate through Chester Zoo's Act for Wildlife page, um, and that goes to their Act for Wildlife campaign, and that's um, that money would be used for lots of different projects, um, not just the Living with Tigers. Uh, and I would also like to say that this lovely drawing was done um, by one of my friends, um, who's, who's our chip Chitwan coordinator Prakash. Uh, it's beautiful. I asked him to do a drawing for me of, of humans, tigers and leopards coexisting together and he drew this beautiful drawing for me. It's lovely. So thank you to him. Um, so finally, I just want to make sure that everyone is acknowledged. Uh, you know, this project would not have been possible and my PhD project would not have been possible without any of these people. So everyone at Chester Zoo, uh, Green Governance Nepal, DMPWC, NTNC, Chitwan National Park, Bardia National Park, the communities, um, Royal Zoological Society of Scotland, Wild Genes, who helped me with the genetics. The same for Centre for Molecular Dynamics Nepal. There are genetics lab in Nepal who helped me. Wild Track and also the Darwin Initiative for funding phase one of the Living with Tigers project. So if anyone has any questions, uh, I will answer them. Um, this is my my email if anyone's got any other questions or if they want to talk about anything uh, and that's my twitter uh, account and i regularly post blogs uh, from the work that we do um and um uh, and great pictures from our field work um and I'm, I'm currently in the final sort of few months of my project um so I'm, I'm writing up everything at the moment um so i'm very excited to to finish all of that and to to publish the data and disseminate everything um, back to to the communities um, and all of our stakeholders. Um, so I'm very excited about that. Um, so yeah, thank you very much, and I will now answer your questions. Okay, A Amy, thank you very much. Um, 
Uh, so, so I'll be now throwing up at you some of the questions that have come through on the chat. There's been quite a few. Um, so I think there's about a dozen or so come through. And so uh, I'm going to go back to the beginning pretty much. So they'll be kind of in chronological order of, of, the, of the talk, more or less. Uh, Great. But uh, so if we start with um, uh, from an ethical point of view, Haley asks from an ethical point of view, uh, how is it decided which uh, communities get the interventions and which communities don't get the interventions act as the control areas? Yes, that's a great question. Um, and ethics is a big part of any social science work and any conservation work. It's very, very important. Um, so I'm glad you brought it up. Um, so the communities decided, uh, all the eight communities decided together who would receive interventions and who would not. Um, and I would like to say that as part of our exit strategy in 2019 to finish phase one, we did intervention, the same interventions that we did in the treatment communities in the control communities. So they did receive interventions, but after we'd finished the project, so we knew that the interventions worked, that they were they had positive impacts and they didn't have negative impacts. So the, the control communities did receive interventions, but not till 2019 as part of our exit strategy. Okay, excellent. Um, Kate Miller asked, uh, asked presumably the, vil the villages that you're working with and in the area predate the uh, creation of the national parks in the area. Yes, uh, to a point. So villages are constantly you know, expanding and new ones pop up. Um, uh, so, um, so Buddy a National Park was established in 1988, um, and um, uh, Chitwan National Park um, was established in um, 1973. It was the first national park established in 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 Nepal. Um, so. Uh, at that time, some communities were um, uh, relocated um, and, and they were okay with that. And then the buffer zones were established um, afterwards. Um, and people who wanted to stay within those buffer zones um, did so. Um, and they get benefits from being in the buffer zone. So um, all the tourism that comes from... Um, each national park between 30 and 50 percent of the profits of tourism go to the community uh, buffer zone committees it's divided up between the different committees um, and those those money are used for different activities within the communities depending on what they need so that that is then divided up again for you know livelihoods improving roads conservation work it, it's all split up so they get benefits from being inside the buffer zone of the of the of the parks. Okay. Um, Alison asked, has uh, there been any traditional problem with bushmeat hunting in this area? Uh, so um, uh, the, the bushmeat term is often more related to Africa because it, it's called the bush. Uh, we're, we're moving towards terming it wild meat rather than bushmeat. Yep. Um, uh, so it, it's not considered a high threat. There is some, I mean, I don't study that topic. Um, uh, there are people who know a lot more about it than I do, uh, but it's, it's not a large threat in Nepal. It, it, it's not um, something that people do regularly because uh, they tend to eat goat um, uh, for traditional events like weddings or celebrations um uh but most of the time they eat chicken so there's large um sort of community chicken farms or they just have them themselves and they eat them um so it, it's not it's not the same um as as the sort of um bush meat in africa it's it's not it's not a traditional thing okay um yeah but but poaching is is still done but it's it's very low okay uh, but presumably there is a certain amount of, of hunting and foraging that goes on, uh, which is part of where 
people come into conflict. Um, so Anthony Melville was asking, uh, uh, is it the sort of tradition locally to uh, to go on such expeditions on your own or do people hunt and forage in groups? And if they go in groups, uh, has there been any record ever of uh, be, uh, groups being attacked by animals or is it only when individuals are on their own that they get attacked? Mm. Um, yeah, so like I said before, generally people don't go hunting, they would go foraging for resources. Um, so again, particularly firewood um, and thatched grass for their roofs, but that's yeah. more um, uh, once a year that they go and collect large amounts of grass for their, their houses, for their roofs. Um, other things like fishing, collecting snails, um, and then fodder, so different types of plants for their livestock. They'll go and collect that. Um, and most of the time, I'd say they go in groups. Some people do go by themselves. They The time varies when they go. Uh, the group size varies. Um, the majority of natural resource collection is done by women. Um, it, men also do it, but the majority is done by, by women. Um, uh, yeah, they generally do go in groups. Um, uh, so human wildlife instances occur at different times be, with different wildlife. So rhinos, elephants, sloth bears, wild boar, tigers and leopards. They're sort of the, the main ones that we have conflict issues with. Um, and these incidences occur um, when they're in groups or when they're by themselves. Generally, only one person gets injured or, or you know, um, there's a fatality. Um, so um, it's often when they're collecting natural resources. Um, so they'll be bent over and often the vegetation can be very tall. Ah. So, uh, you know, we don't know, but there may be, um, you know, people may just look like prey hiding in the grass. Um, so generally, yeah, like I said, most instances, people um, are are injured and then the animal goes away because they realize it's not prey and and they and they move away um uh, yeah i hope that answers your question if, if you're you know if you are interested I, I can tell you lots of different papers um that talk about that the those different instances okay um sally gillard raised an interesting point i mean it's in the in a, a assumption of, of us all that uh, um, all this work really is uh, to encourage the conservation and development of, of, of thriving of the species involved. Uh, but if the numbers of tigers and leopards increase, if you're successful in, in encouraging that sort of thing, mm. then will that mean that that there'll be increased interactions and therefore increased conflict. And if that's the case, um, will more land somehow be, need to be put aside? And what uh, what research, if any, has gone into that aspect already? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, yes, so we don't know if the leopard population is increasing. We just hope it is. Uh, because the, t the tiger population is increasing and leopards can coexist with tigers, uh, they, they do avoid them in, uh, to a point. Um, but um, uh, then, yes, basically a, a good population, a viable population of tigers is 80. Uh, that means that, you know, there's good genetic diversity. Um, so each of the national parks that we work in holds more than that. Um, so Bardia currently has uh, 86, for example, tigers. Um, and that carry, carrying capacity seems to be okay, but that is reaching uh, a limit. Um, but that's why we have the buffer zone as well. Uh, so they also use the buffer zone. Plus we have corridors. So for example, yeah. Chitwa National Park borders Valmiki um, in uh, India, so we we have um, uh, other other research um, by by Nepali researchers have shown that tigers and leopards and other animals move through these corridors to go 
um, so they're transboundary individuals. Um, and basically the triart landscape is part of, it, is, it runs along the bottom of Nepal, but it also is in India. So the triart landscape is Nepal and Indian. Um, and there's a triart landscape uh, program where we hope to link up that landscape as much as possible so that wildlife can move between these different areas. So that's, that is something that Nepal and India would like to do is to join up as much of the TAL as possible um, to do so. And they've started that process by putting in different corridors and monitoring movements and see, you know, which animals are moving and how often and, um, and whether they're finding new territories and things like that. So it, it's happening, but landscape scale conservation is complex uh, so it takes time. Okay. Um, a question. I'd like to ask a question, actually. Um, those that know me know that uh, my particular obsession is tracks and signs, so it relate, relates to the the uh, tracking app. Um, so on. Um, you, you, I was interested, you say that the app uh, identifies um, male and female and species of male and female. Um, I was wondering, do you have to define from your observation which are rear and front feet? Um, because obviously there would be an that would influence the decision as to whether it's male and female, um, because uh, uh, of the different sizes of relative sizes of uh, and shapes of rear, rear and front feet. So, would yeah. you like to discuss that? Yes. So. Um... Basically, like I said before, the, the algorithm that we used is based on known, known individuals. So we basically, we work with zoos all over the world collecting footprints from known individuals. And we try and get a sequence of eight photos so we can try and get um, left and front, back and, and you know, right and all, all the different uh, prints. So we can understand how one individual's print can vary um, and the difference between male and female of that subspecies. Okay. So we've done that for tigers and leopards and wild track have done that for other species like pumas and cheetahs, rhinos. It was originally designed for rhino tracking. That's where their specialty lies. And then it's transitioned into um, other species. Um, so that's what that, so the algorithm, depending on the species, is generally over 90 percent accurate. Um, I think for pumas, it came out at 97 percent and similar for cheetahs. Um, uh, it also depends on how good your tracks can be, the substrate that you're working with, how often you get tracks. Um, so a lot of the time we could only record one or two prints in a sequence because the terrain sometimes is just not right. Or there's often a lot of leaf litter. Um, so you just get a print that's just happened to fall in between where there's no leaves and then there's no other print anywhere. So you get one and you're like, oh, OK, the tiger's vanished. Uh, but you just get this one print. Um, so yeah, it, it's a it's a fantastic technique, which is why it's you know award winning. It, it's based on robust algorithms, um, but basically it's only as good as the data you put into it. So you know if if you're not getting uh, long enough trails or you're not getting a lot of good quality prints, then obviously your accuracy level would go down. However, they're also now working with lots of different um, uh, AI specialists um, and doing lots of um, new algorithm testing to try and improve how we understand bad prints. So where there's, you know, a half a toe missing or not a full pad or things like that. So can we really, basically they're trying to constantly trying to improve what they're doing, but their original analysis is still fantastic. And it works really well. And they're, they're constantly doing new ones. I think they're doing a hyena project now. So um, yeah, it's, it's a great, a great software. Excellent. Okay. Um, Sally Gillard raises an interesting question. Uh, are there any plans to extend this approach to other countries or communities with similar problems? So there are lots of projects like this. Um, there's some several other good um, human tiger conflict projects. Um, so there's um, uh, there's one in Bangladesh by Wild Team. Um, that was their first sort of big project working with um, communities. Um, 
So they have a lot of problems um, in in the sort of Bangladesh Sundarbans with with conflict. Uh, it's quite complex because often the tigers get stuck in certain places when it floods really heavily. Um, so it's, it's quite a complex situation. Um, so that's a really good project. Um, uh, and then there's some new projects coming up in India as well, doing, um, uh, yeah, the same thing. Um, so yeah, it, it's it's definitely um, it's, it's definitely growing. There's lots of lots of communities. I mean, this is why we share everything. So all of this information is 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 public on our Darwin Initiative reports um, and our dissemination information to the communities, um, and all the papers that we're writing. Um, you know, are open source, so people should be able to access them. And again, um, once they're published, I will um, do a short version of them um, and translate them into Nepali and share the information at a local level. Because um, obviously most, most people won't read a scientific paper, um, you know, at that local level. So it needs to be disseminated in, in the right way um, for that information to be, to be useful on the ground. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, there's lots of great projects happening, um, and you know we, we can learn from other species as well. So there's some great um, projects um, on human lion conflict um, as well, and snow leopard projects. Um, so yeah, we we can all learn from each other. This is why sharing knowledge is is so important. So we can learn, um, and also why testing that testing those interventions. Just because it might work with snow leopards doesn't mean it doesn't mean it'll work with tigers. So we, we test them and make sure they work before we scale them up. Excellent. Um, interesting question from Ollie here. Uh, given that you've um, reduced the predation of uh, livestock significantly, um, has this removed effectively a, a food source for the predators? And does that have a... Uh, uh, a negative effect on the on the predators success yeah no great question um so this is why we wanted to make sure that we had information from different communities because potentially you could just um uh, that behavior still might exist in in the species but you're just moving it to another community if you put predator proof pens in one community they might just go to another one so you're just displacing the behavior rather than changing the behavior. Uh, but our, our data doesn't show that. It, it, they just move away from that, but those, those villages and go back to the forest. Um, so, so because we're still analyzing the diet uh, data, we, I can't answer that question for our individual tigers and leopards. However, from other um, studies before me that have done it, um, uh, it, the amount of livestock that they eat within their diet is very low. Um, so it's not a main food source for them. Um, so if they weren't able to get it, they'll just go and hunt something else. It, you know, it, it, it's like, you know, if, if, if you've got a Sainsbury's down the road and it closed and it's five minutes further to walk to go to the co-op, then you'll have to go there. And that's what will happen. You'll, you know, you expend more energy to do so, but you still get the food you need. Um, so they're only doing it because it's easy. Uh, so if we don't make it easy for them, then they won't do it and they'll go back to what they should be doing, which is eating natural prey, which is their natural, uh, you know, energy expenditure that they've got to do as part of their cost benefit analysis as a predator. So uh, yeah it shouldn't be a problem for them. They have plenty of other prey that they can be eating. Okay. Um, and this might, I think we're getting to the end of the long list of questions. Um, but uh, one from Silfest Mogal. Uh, did the project members coming from the outside experience any particular issues of trust in the local communities? Um, and if so, how, would, how was that uh, settled and dealt with? Uh, so I hope I'm going to answer this correctly. You're asking whether project members in terms of us as outsiders came in 
and the communities had any issues of trust with us. That's right. That's Rather, right. yeah, okay. Um, no, not particularly. Um, so there are other good NGOs that work in Nepal that do good conservation work. Um, so ZSL, WWF, things like that. And there's some really good local NGOs um, as well. So NTNC, so um, National Trust for Nature Conservation, they do some great work. Um, and also um, Nepal Tiger Trust, a uh, small NGO in Chitwan. Um, so um, no, trust wasn't really a, a problem. Um, they were very welcoming. Um, uh, Nepali culture is, is very, very welcoming. Um, uh, it's one of the reasons why I, I particularly enjoy working there is the people. Um, and yeah, no, I didn't find that we had any trust issues, but, but we involved the communities from the big, from the beginning, you know, we had stakeholder meetings with them, you know, when the project was being designed. And then when we first started the project, you know, in 2016, we, we went out and had more stakeholder meetings. You know, I involved the communities in the research, we gave them constant updates. Um, and eight people um, that were part of our Living With Tigers team are from those communities. So we had um, uh, two, two main people who coordinated those, those four people. So, so from each of the communities, we had someone from there who was part of our team and they could constantly disseminate information and we could constantly get feedback from the communities. So they were part of the project the whole time. So if we had any problems, they could tell us. If we weren't doing something well enough, you know, we could talk to them about it and try and improve the way we were doing things. Um, so I didn't find that trust was an issue, but that's probably because we include the communities the whole way, which is I think how conservation should be done because most conservation problems involve people. Um, so they should they should be involved from start to end. And like I said, we had stakeholder meetings at the end where we we brought them in and we asked them, you know, tell us your feedback. What what did we do well? What could we improve on? What would you like us to do? You know, in phase two. Um, so yeah, we just continually include them in the project. Okay, thank you very much, Amy. That's uh, that's great. Uh, um, I think. Uh, You've got you managed to satisfy a lot of uh, a lot of interesting questions there. Um, so I'm aware, aware that we've run a little bit over the hour, but uh, but thank you very much for, for doing that. Thank uh, you very much for having me. And I'm now going to hand back to uh, Alison uh, for some closing announcements. Well, thank you, Amy. That was an absolute tour de force. Um, thank you so much for sharing with us. I mean, it seems an amazing project. I think partly it's so multifaceted that you, you know, yeah. you're covering ecology, sociology, but also, and just so much engaged with the local people that one has great confidence, the benefits will go forward.